If you'll turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, I uh, hope you'll be patient with me. This is the first time I've preached standing up for a couple months now. Uh, I've either been sitting on a couch or sitting on a stool, so it's going to be a little bit different for me and a little different for you having to wear a mask, but I think we'll get through all of this with those that are here, and thank you for those who are joining us online as well. And so uh, today I want to just look at what the church is, as we come back together, what do we need to be as a church? In Acts chapter 2, and beginning with verse number 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common." and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and signals of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added the church daily such as should be saved. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we pray as we open up your word today that you would open it to our hearts and to our lives. We thank you for each one that's here in the auditorium, for those that were in the early service, and for those that are joining us online. And we pray that each one can receive a blessing and a challenge from the message today. Lord, we want as a church, as we come back together again, to build a unity and to come together to have things in common, to, uh, to have a, a harmony as a church. And so we pray that you'd help us to do that. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You look in verse number 44, it says, and all that believe were together. And, and it is nice to be together again. Uh, unfortunately, we can't have everybody together in one service, but we had a, a good group out this morning, early service. We have another good group here today in the second service. And of course, those of you online, we consider you the third person in the auditorium, and we're glad that you've joined together with us as well. And, uh, and, and also in verse number 46, it says, and they continue daily with one accord. And, and that word accord, it, it means to harmonize. You watch the uh, singers up here just a while ago, and each of them were singing different parts, but all of the parts harmonized and came together to create beautiful music. And what we want to do as a church is we want to come together with one accord to harmonize as a church. Now, I want to talk today about being united as a church. We've been separated for a couple of months now, and now we're coming back together, and we need to be united. And when you look at the word united, what's important to remember is you United starts with you. It starts with you. And right there in the middle of the word is the, is the letter I. And united depends on you. It depends on I. It depends on each one of us. Turn over your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And look at verses 16 through 18. Romans chapter 12 and verses 16 through 18. The Bible says, Be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And so united depends on you. As much as lieth in you is where the responsibility comes. Unity starts with you. In, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, the Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The word follow is an interesting word. It literally can be translated as to pursue or even to persecute to pursue or to persecute. And as we come back together as a church, as a church body, we need to pursue one another almost to the point of persecution and just saying, I want you to be part of this family and I want to reach out to you to know that you are loved and connected. You see, as, a, as United States of America, uh, we need to have unity. And one of the things that unfortunately in this past week, we've seen some disunity with all that's happening on the mainland. Now, I want to state as a church that what happened to that gentleman there in Minneapolis by the police was wrong. There's no doubt about that when you watch the video, and those that perpetrated that should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Uh, and I believe that the people that came out to protest that had every right, privilege, and even responsibility to make their voices heard. What I do believe was wrong was the way they protested some of them in uh, the riot 
riot and the burning and the looting and all that happened there, uh, I think that took away from the message rather than brought focus upon the message, and we would certainly condemn that. But one of the challenges that we have as a country is to be united. And and we have divisions, and one of those divisions is through racial divisions. And, And as a church and as Christians, we ought to do all we can to overcome those divisions and to create unity uh, as a church and to help in our nation as well. And one of the things that we are the United States of America, and one of the blessings we have is freedom. We have freedom. And I wonder, are you free today? Are you free today? In John chapter 8 and verse number 32, Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In verse number 36, it says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so I wonder, do you have the freedom that comes in Jesus Christ? Do you have the freedom from your sin? Do you have freedom from the guilt of your sin? Do you have the forgiveness of your sin? Do you have that freedom that only comes through Jesus Christ? You see, uh, in order to enjoy freedoms, we've got to know the truth. We've got to know the truth. A lot of times, you, and you hear this a lot in this past week, as people say things like, well, I have my constitutional rights. Or, you know, the Bill of Rights gives me that freedom. And, and I, I believe that's true here in America. But here's the thing. Most people have never read the Constitution. Most people have never read the Bill of Rights. Maybe way back in school at one point, that was an assignment they were given, but uh, maybe they didn't even do it then. Uh, Most people really don't know what the Constitution says. They don't know what the Bill of Rights says. In in fact, you're all familiar with the statement, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain... Now, what's the next word? Is it inalienable or unalienable? How many think the next word is inalienable? Raise your hand. How many think the next word is unalienable? Raise your hand. How many are too afraid to to say no? uh, But here's the point. You know what? Both of you are right. In the original, when it was written, it was written as inalienable, but in the actual printed document that was signed, it was unalienable rights. And, uh, you know, just it's an interest to me that many people that cra- claim their constitutional rights don't even know what the Constitution says. They haven't even read it. And the same thing is true with freedom in Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in John chapter 5 and verse number 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. If you're going to claim freedom from your sin and freedom in Jesus Christ, it needs to be right here in this word. You need to make sure from the scriptures that you have that freedom that only he can give. You see, that freedom is offered to everyone no matter what their race. You know, black lives do matter. And they matter to Jesus Christ because he died for them as well as for me and for you. And, and we need to realize that our true freedom comes in Christ. We need to have the truth. In 1 John chapter 5 and verses 12 and 13, it says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And so today, do you know the truth? Do you know if you died today that you'd go to heaven? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know that you have eternal life? If you don't know that for sure, you need to make sure. And, and, you know, I'm an American basically by accident of birth. Now, I believe in the providence of God, and I thank God that I was born here in America, but I'm an American because I was born in America. If my mom had been somewhere else, I'd, I'd not have been American. And, and, and that, that's a good thing here in America if you're born to be American. But you know what? You're not born to be a Christian. You've got to be born again. In John chapter 1 and verse number 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And if you're going to be a child of God, if you're going to have the freedom of salvation, it is not just by being born in a Christian home. You've got to be born again by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. I remember I was in Texas at one time, and, and you know, down in Texas, I think it's required by law that everybody has to have a truck, you know. And uh, I was behind this big old Ford truck, and on the bumper of that truck was a bumper sticker that said, Texan by choice. 
and he was kind of making a point. Uh, you may have been accidentally born in Texas, but I chose to live in Texas. Now, I don't know why he did that, but he did that. And uh, you got to choose to be a Christian. You're not accidentally born again. You got to choose to be born again. In John chapter 3 and verse number 7, it says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you need to believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You need to be born again by putting your faith and trust in him. There's a well-known plaque on the Statue of Liberty that says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift up my lamp beside the golden door. And that's a great uh, opportunity for people to come to America. And I'm thankful for that opportunity. But you know what? If you truly want to be free, you've got to come to Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so we need to come to Jesus Christ for salvation. We need to come to Jesus Christ for the freedom that only he can give. And it's a choice that you have to make. In Romans chapter 10 and verses 9 and 10, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon Jesus Christ? Have you come to him for your salvation, for your freedom? You cannot have the freedom that comes by being united until you're united with Jesus Christ as Savior. But you know, here in America, we have freedom also because we have laws. Now you say, well, how can you have freedom and still have laws? You see, freedom, turn to Galatians chapter 5. The Bible uses the term liberty. And I hear many Christians talk about, well, I have liberty in Jesus Christ. Well, what does that liberty entail? Is it the freedom to do wrong? No, I believe it's the freedom to do right. In Galatians chapter 5 and beginning with verse number uh, 13, it says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one, and take heed that you be not consumed one of another. You see, the liberty is not the freedom to do wrong. In Judges chapter 17 and verse number 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We have seen in this past week what happens when people do what, they, what is right in their own eyes and don't obey the law. It's chaos. It's anarchy. We, liberty is not the freedom to do wrong. We live in the United States, arguably the freest country in the world. And did you know there are 50,000 federal laws? We're free, but we have 50,000 federal laws, and that doesn't count state laws or county laws or city laws. Why, if we're free, do we have so many laws? Because freedom requires law. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and look at verses 13 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. It says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king as supreme or as unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him, For the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. You know, with all the uh, the laws that have been imposed on us during this COVID virus uh, pandemic, a lot of people complain, well, we're, we live in a free country. How can they tell us we have to wear masks? And how can they tell us that we have to stay home or, or not go to church? Because that's what the job of the government is. We may not like the laws, but we are responsible as Christians to obey the laws. Now, there are times where we ought to obey God rather than men. 
And, but that's something that is a great responsibility we need to do very carefully. And I don't think in this situation the laws overstep those boundaries. And so we have a responsibility in our liberty to obey the law. You see, the law is not bad. It is good. In Romans chapter 7 and verse number 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The, the purpose of the law is to show me when I'm wrong. You, you ever been di- driving down the road, and, and you're coming down the road, and there's no speed limit signs? And then all of a sudden, you see a, a police car parked on the side of the road up there, and you're thinking, I wish I knew what the speed limit was. Because I don't know if I'm breaking the law if I don't know what the law is. And the law shows me when I'm violating that and I need the law in my life. You see, but the law is not about just not doing wrong, but the law is also about doing right. It's, It's the freedom to do what's right. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 8 and 9, it says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers and fathers uh, of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. You see, I don't need locks on my door for the honest people. I need locks on my door for the dishonest people. And if we are doing right, we don't need the law because we're going to do what's right. See, let me illustrate that for you. Most of you have got in your pocket or your purse what I've got right here, and that's a driver's license, right? You've all got a driver's license, and and that driver's license gives you freedom, does it not? I remember when I was about 16 years old, I went to my mom, and I said, I want to get my driver's license. And, 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 And I went out and got it, and when I got it, I felt like, man, now I'm free. Now, does driver's license give you the freedom to drive over the speed limit? Does a driver's license give you the freedom to run through red lights, to drive like a maniac? No, it does not. In fact, you can prove this very simply. After church, on your way home, I want you, if you see a police car, I want you to speed up to 100 miles an hour. And when he pulls you over and comes to your window, you open the window and say, it's okay, officer, I have a license. And see how far that gets you. Because this license is not the liberty to do wrong, it's the freedom to, do right, to drive right. When I got my license, I had to obey all the laws, plus my mom put a bunch of laws on me too. She said, you're not going to have more than as many friends in your car, and you're not going to be out after this time at night. Uh, there, but it still gave me freedom. I didn't have to depend on her anymore. I had the freedom to get in the car and drive someplace. I had the freedom to go to the store, go see my friends. But it's a freedom, a liberty that comes with laws. So liberty is not the freedom to do wrong. It is the freedom to do what's right. It's the freedom to do what's right. Now, unity starts with you. But unity is being part of a unit. Wherever you go, you're a part of a unit. Those of you in the military are not just a part of the army as a whole. You're a part of a very specific unit within the army. And the same thing is true for us as Christians. We're part of a unit of believers, a body of believers called a church. Now, here's the problem, though. Turn over your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. How do you measure unity? How do you look at a church and say, that's a church that has unity? How do you measure that? There's a lot of different ways you can measure things. I, I've got some things up here. I've got a scale. I've got a clock. I've got a tape measure. Uh, I've got a, a, a measuring glass here. Uh, I've got the thermometer. All kinds of things to measure with. But they're all different kinds of measurements. You know, if I wanted to know, well, you know, one of the things is I've had to learn is, is my timing on preaching. Because when you're online, you can't go as long. So I want to make sure I don't go over time. So I'm going to measure how long my sermon is. You think that's going to work? Or, or, you know, when you guys come here, we have to check your temperature. And, and so we're gonna, what we're going to do is next week, we're going to have this out there to check your temperature with. Everybody's going to have to check their temperature on this. Uh, you don't look too happy about that. Because this isn't going to, ch- this does not measure temperature. You see, each of these items have got a a different way of measuring. So how do you measure unity within the church? How do we know we have a church that's united? Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verses 12 and 13. 
for the perfecting of the saints, is talking about the church, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Look down at verse number 16. For from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted that by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase the body on the edifying self in love. So we need to measure our unity. You, you could start with a, a tape measure type measurement. It says here in, in verse number uh, 13, it says, under the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ. And so, you know, you're, you measure the stature is how tall, how much something has grown. You measure your children, see how much they've grown over the years. And we can measure our unity by our growth. Are we growing as individual Christians? Are we growing as a church body? Our, our spiritual growth is one way to measure unity. When you have unity, you also have growth. And when growth stops, that's going to affect your unity. So are we growing in the Lord? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, it says, For the which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. One of the challenges that we've had as we've been a part in our own homes worshiping is to maintain that worship, that weight of glory in worshiping God. As we mentioned earlier in the pre-service, you know, before we had this great big 60-voice choir, we had 15 to 20 instruments playing, we had a full auditorium, people singing, and then you go home and you're watching four people sing on a screen, a little screen with your family on the kitchen, on the, on the living room couch. That changes how worship feels. So did you continue to worship the Lord even in that situation? You see, the weight of glory, I believe one of the signs of unity within the church is are we worshiping and praising God? Are, are we dealing with the, the sin in our lives? In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is before us. Now, I do have a scale here, and we use a scale to measure how heavy we are. Now, all of us think we're overweight, right? We, we want to be lighter, as most all of us do. And so what do we do when we get on that scale? We, we empty our pockets. You know, we take our phone out, we take our wallet out, we take our keys out, we even take our shoes off uh, before we get on that scale, don't we? And then we get on the scale and we look at the number, and then what do we do after we get off the scale? We put it all right back on. Well, who are we fooling? We're fooling ourselves. You know what happens? We come to church, we lay aside the weights, but then we walk out those doors and we put it all right back on. Who are we fooling? You see, the real test is what do we do with this? Are we going to keep them laid aside? Are, are we going to put those sins away and those things that are holding us back from the Lord? I think another way to measure our unity is by overflowing blessings. You know, when you, when you can pour it in there, it just overflows. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38. Turn over there if you would. Luke chapter 6 and look at verse number 38. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For the same measure that you met with all, it shall be measured to you again. Running over the blessings of God. I believe when a church is being blessed of God so much, it's just pouring out everywhere. That shows unity. Why do I believe that? If you look at verses 31 through 37, you'll see. If you love them which love you, what they have you, for sinners also love the same. If you do good to them which do good to you, if you lend to them that lend to you, you're kind. He says, love your enemies. See, when we are loving one another, you want God to bless you? Be a blessing. And I believe a church that's unified, they're blessing one another, and the blessings are just pouring out everywhere. Another way to, to, to measure unity is in fellowship and time. We've got a clock here, and we measure by time. How much time are we spending in fellowship? One of the challenges the last two months is we've all been isolated. You couldn't even have somebody over your home. You couldn't go see people. But now we can. The real test of unity is how much we start really getting together. 
not just here in church, but on our own through Bible studies and fellowship at homes and, 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 and fellowship together. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 23 through 25, it says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he's faithful that promise. And let us consider one another, provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the approaching. Folks, we spent two months isolated and now we've got to get back together. Not just in church, but in Bible study and fellowship and just being with one another. And then we can measure by the spiritual temperature. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, it says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. What's your spiritual temperature? When you walked in today, everybody had to have their temperature taken. Otherwise, you didn't get that little sticker on there. But what's your spiritual temperature? Are you on fire for God? In Luke chapter 24 and verse 32, it says, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to the scriptures? I believe a sign of unity is when we're on fire for God. Unity, whether we're united or untied, all depends on where you put the eye. Whether we're united as a church or untied, all depends on where you put the eye. Go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 and look at verses 36 through 40. Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse number 36. Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see, folks, the difference between united and being untied is all dependent on where we put the eye. Where am I going to put myself? Am I going to put God first, others second, and myself last? In Psalms 133, verse number one, it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We as a church need to be united. That's what pleases God. And I want to challenge us as we come back together, let's be united as we move forward. Now what unites us? Psalms 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The more we're in the word of God, the more united we're going to be. And there's strength in unity. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, the Bible talks about a, a threefold cord is not easily broken. And our strength comes by coming together in Jesus Christ. We want to be united, not untied. Turn them back to Ephesians chapter 4. Just got a few verses and we're going to close. Ephesians chapter 4. I don't like to wear shoes that you have to tie, especially here in Hawaii. Because everywhere you go, you got to take your shoes off. And then when you're standing out there at the doorway, you're trying to tie your shoes because a lot of places don't have a place to sit down to do that. And, and so I, I, I mostly wear slip-on shoes. And, 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 but I do have a, 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 a pair of shoes that are very comfortable, but they're tie shoes. Now, I keep a shoehorn at home so I can put them on without untying them. My wife says that's because I'm so lazy. But I just like slipping shoes on rather than tie them. But the problem with those shoes is, is that as I'm going about my day, they keep coming on tight. I've even tied them in double knots, and they still keep coming on tight. And so throughout the day, I have to stop and tie my shoes again. And, and you know, that's the same thing is true in relationships. Relationships come on tight, and we got to tie them back up again. In Ephesians chapter 4, look at verses 3 through 6. It says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. That's unity. And what do we have to do? It says endeavoring. That means you got to work at it. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easily. Human nature fights against it. But we've got to work at creating that unity and creating the ties. You see, what is it that ties us together? 
What is it that ties us together? It's the common bond in Jesus Christ. It's the love for God and for his word. It's the love for souls. It's, a, it's those things that bring us together as a body. It's things like prayer. In Job chapter 12 and verse 23, it says, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against you in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. I think that's actually 1 Samuel 12, 23. But the point is this. We, as a church body, need to be praying for each other, especially now. And I hope you've been praying, and I hope you'll continue to pray, because that prayer brings unity. It's the shared joy and even the tears. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 15 and 16. It'll be on the screen also. It says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. See, we need to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. There are folks in our church that are hurting right now. I, I think of somebody like the Abrahams who are, are making arrangements to take their two-year-old grandson back to Micronesia to bury him. I think of other folks who have gone through some medical issues or people that are facing other challenges, get ready to deploy. And we ought to weep with those that weep, but we ought to rejoice with those that rejoice. I am so thankful and joyful to see you this morning. And I want to share the joys of the Lord with you. We'll close with Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Look back there. Look over there. Everybody, everybody look, turn around. Look, look back over there. Look, look, look. See? All right. I made you look. And that was my goal. Because I want you to listen to these verses. Listen to what it says in Philippians chapter 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And here's verse four. Look not every man on the things of others, but every man, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's where our unity comes from. It comes from Jesus Christ. Look around this room, folks. This is a very diverse group. Many different nationalities, people from many different backgrounds, from all across the country, all across the world. People from different socioeconomic levels. And yet we come here to be united with the mind of Christ. But you've got to look. You've got to look at others and not yourself. We're doing a Bible study in a book called I Am a Church Member by Thomas Rain, Rainer. You can order it online through Amazon. We got some copies hopefully coming in this week. We're doing small group Bible studies and I hope you've gotten to be a part of one of them. And in, that chap in chapter two of there, just talk, in chapter one and two, it talks about this idea of unity and it talks about how that we need to look at a church as not being what's in it for me, but what's in it for others. One of the first questions that was asked in those that did the Bible study is what do you look for when you look for a church? And when they evaluated the questions afterwards, all of them were very self-centered. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to look for a church that teaches doctrine. I want to look for a church that's got ministries that are going to minister to my family and, and are going to help me to grow in the Lord. But church is not just about what I can get. It's about what I can give. Psalms 122 verse 1 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And then verse 9 says, because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. It's about looking for others and how I can be a blessing. And that's the challenge we have as we move forward, is how can we be a blessing as we unite in Jesus Christ? Let's bow for prayer.